as the kulik is just lit now, we ask, Lord, that you'll be with us, that your presence will be here, that the light from the hulik will be symbolizing your light of love that shining down on us, helping us tell our stories of the residential schools. We bless each person here and we extend our invitation, Father, to those who are in our community who want to come out and tell our story. We thank you for the safe journey for our visitors here and the facilitators, and we ask your wisdom, your strength, and your power to be here at this gathering today. We ask that you'll be with us for the next couple of days as we tell our story and help us with our emotions and not to be afraid to speak and finally say our word. Northwest River Boarding School it was founded in 1926 by Yale University students who work with the International Grenfell Association. The International Grenfell Association was founded by Dr. Grenfell in 1910 to provide health care, education, religious services and social activities in Newfoundland and Labrador. They established residential schools in three other communities, Muddy Bay, Cartwright, in St. Anthony. In 1949, Newfoundland and Labrador became the 10th province of Canada. Six years later, in 1955, the new provincial government took control of education in Labrador. School attendance became compulsory. In 1957, Labrador saw a new wave of schools constructed with the funding from federal and provincial governments. The majority of Inuit students from Labrador's northern coast were sent hundreds of kilometers from their communities to attend school in Northwest River. The following stories are from just a handful of the many students who attended the Northwest River Residential School during the 1960s and 70s. My mother sits by the window crying. Her heart is breaking. It's the same memory every fall. The plane has taken her children away, and they are gone for all winter. It's time for them to go to school, and school is 90 miles away. We will not see them again for 10 months. There was this, this sickening emptiness in the community. A lot of your friends are gone, and your brothers, sisters, whatever, gone. A lot of sadness, a lot of pain, a lot of quiet, but like it's just this emptiness. And for years and years and years, I dreaded the fall all my life. It was depressing, it was sad, it was lonely. Because they were probably starting to go even before I was born, they my older siblings. So fall was pure dread. In the spring, my brothers and sisters return. The plane flies overhead. My mother is running and crying. She is crippled, but she can run today. I hide behind my mother's dress. I'm shy. My brothers and sisters are strangers. Four, four of my sisters went and uh, wondered what it was like out there because um, like I hardly used to see them when they were in and um, we weren't really close and when they came, came back to Nain, seemed like they were different people, like I really didn't know them and um, felt kind of they were strangers because we really never uh, saw each other for periods of time. I would just like to say that I'm honored to be here right in the Hulik. My act moved up. I remember when she used to go to school with the sugar. When they used to come back, I used to try to follow them around all the time, husband and his mom. Because they look so nice with all their nice clothes and their pretty hair and they look so clean and they all stuck together even when they were at home. 
I don't need no other sugar. Soon it will be my turn to go. When I turn 12 or 13, I have to leave too. I'm scared and excited at the same time. I'm venturing out into a new world. What a sickening feeling I remember. Here, even the plane taking off, that sound is echoing everywhere. And just seeing home, me, eh? home behind me. That was it, not a thing you could do. Get through it. Just gotta get through it. It's like going from two families. Go down the land. Go down an airplane, and you don't even know where you're going. Mm -hmm. And then landing in Northwest River to the dock, and there's this huge big building in front of you, and this old lady comes out and leads you up to this building. <laughs> And you go inside and there's a 70 or 80 other kids there. And this is your new, your new home now for, the, for the next year. Because you won't see your parents now until you go home next, next spring in June. Something. The dorms of Northwest River were divided into three age groups. The infant's home, the junior dorm, and the senior dorm. It was the residence for students attending middle school and high school, which were not provided in northern communities. They also became the home for children whose parents had been deemed unfit by the authorities. I was taken away from my parents when I was in the dorm. My first one, I was eight, I think. I seen kids taken younger than that. Bill was five, I think. Yeah. I remember them taking Richard. Richard and Bill were some age of them. Oh, jeez. I remember being on the wharf, kicking and screaming. He was, didn't want to go, didn't want to go. As soon as we hit the dock, when the plane landed and got off the plane, I could feel the, oh, the place, how old the place we were there. And it, like hit me right, right hard. I said, oh my God, I didn't think it could be like this. Then, the, then, and this when I, I think this when I first experienced how hurtful people could be and how prejud uh, much prejudice hurts. young age and we received a purse, we have a hundred dollars a month and which you got ten dollars out of, you had to pay phone calls out if you had to call home, you had, that had to come out of your bursary. And uh, some were more fortunate than others, some could receive financial assistance from home while others couldn't go. You had to go to work at the hospital, you had to take the news that we received, you had to be belittled, you had to accept that that was the acceptable behavior. You did nothing, you just said nothing. Otherwise, you'd have uh, comebacks at you and vengeance, which you didn't want. You just really had to almost like function like a, a robot. Verbal abuse, um, all the time. And it, I think it's just from, it was from the same group of people. I wonder why were they like that? I mean, what kind of bringing they, did they have to be like that, treat people the way they treated us? The physical abuse was bad, like being run after dirt and I had my hair pulled on. Um, people's trying, there's a little small kid trying to pee on us. One time when we were to a dance and <clears throat> there was adults there looking at him, trying to do that to us. And they weren't doing nothing. They were just looking at him trying to do it and they weren't trying to tell him to stop and that made us feel worse, I think. And the verbal abuse I think was the worst being called 
Eskimos, Eskimos, and making fun of our language, like talking funny, like gay bang. They're like making fun of our language. You know, when I would try to talk to a couple of people from native, try to talk to the Inuit people. <laughs> Teacher told us to stop, stop talking our language because they thought we were talking about them. In 1955, when the Newfoundland government assumed responsibility for Aboriginal affairs, English was the sole language of instruction in schools, and Inuktitut was not permitted in the classroom. We talked funny. 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 Eating raw meat. Got so used to it, never even bothered, never even bothered me anymore. There was one day though that we were in the bathroom and it happened to be there. And he said, "Move, move away, you old blackie." I said, "Look in the mirror. They're the same color as I am." Don't you get up and talk with me, you old schemer. And no, matter, no matter how hard you fight back, and you lose, and you lose, you always lose it. So I was born in the Northwest. There was only five houses down in the village, which was relocated from Hebron and they would call us the village people. They'd be throwing rocks at us, calling us down the dirt with all kinds of names. And then me and my two sisters and my brother got took away from our parents. They put us in the dorm. They said the worst part was in the summer when everybody went mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. Because their community of two dorm, uh, three dorms, the junior infant's mm -hmm. home and the junior dorm and senior dorm. When I went, the, that senior dorm community was gone. So it was just them. So they felt more alone, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And it never ever changed. They would still call us down the dirt, call us all kinds of names. It would be the same every day. Be going to school in the morning, they'd be there behind you throwing rocks. They would be in the, in the classroom pulling on your hair, they would be behind you pulling on your hair and everything. When I went to the dorm, it was the insiders against the outsiders. And uh, you had to fight your way to school every day in that. I did anyway. We call those names and stuff. I grew up fighting there, and uh, I enjoyed it after. I enjoyed fighting. Got very good at it. Yeah, I got good at it. Yeah. Did you want it hard to stop? Yeah. The only safe place I felt when I was in Northwest was the dorm because once you're outside that yard, you were how baked for them. You had to be careful, you had to be careful when you went out, who was around, who was outside the yard. There were times where I used to run through the woods. Run through the woods there just to get to the dorm. God. There's people there out waiting. You'd never go alone. This is how other places were, like living in another world. There were some people there that were, like, they were nice people. I got to know them and made good friends with with some of them, but the uh, other ones, they continually harass, harass, harass. 
There's also to like uh, infighting in the dorm too because mm -hmm. you were from different communities, right? So you had, you had to protect yourself there too, or your, your siblings. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a hierarchy of big boys, little boys, and then uh, a boss in the little boys' room. You know all that kind of thing you had to go through. For me too, it was uh, really traumatic. Sharing a room, uh, bathrooms with all these strange strangers, mm -hmm. and being very conscious of my body, mm -hmm. and getting all these negative comments about my body, and then the bathrooms had stalls, and you, you went into your bathroom. There might be somebody up looking at you, and it's uh, sickening. Right. You went in from a home into a, like a military style place. Mm -hmm. Barracks. Barracks style bunking and stuff. After two or three weeks, I got, I got homesick. We started crying in the classroom. Then the teacher went down to the principal's office. Then what he done, God, he put me in his lap. I got home like this. God, man. My God, how can people do this? How can they own my life? I feel like I must be in a prison. I can't get away. I can't see my parents, and my heart is breaking. I hate it here. It was so institutionalized, like children were fed, sort of, clothed, sort of, had a bed to sleep in, but they had no love like they would in a family. Like we weren't human anymore. It was like um, a herd of cattle. It was animals. We were treated really like animals. You were fed certain foods. You were expected to behave this way. Well, there was no choice. You either ate what they gave you or you went hungry. Wait for the door to open. The prisoners waiting for food. We had a uh, loss of taste for our wild food and wanting it and not being just able to have the actual foods that we were used to. Like you, did, you had chores at home, but nothing like, like this, right? Like, I guess. When it comes to cleaning, the boys and girls have to do the same cleaning, which I wasn't used to. Like I was more used to door stuff. Like I remember making a slingshot and going after snowbirds. Got in trouble for that. Like you know, killing a little bird. If I was home, I would probably had 22 and hunting partridges. Where when we grew up, we were home. We were happy, carefree. Young and his community where everyone knew you, cared for you, and shared with you. When I talk with my friends that I had from the dorm, all we talk about is the good times. We don't talk about like losing our parenting skills. Coming back home and being caught in the hood seat. Because when we came back, I think I probably felt shame to try to follow, go back to our traditions, follow our, our ways. We want to be more like, because we were made fun of so much in the dorm 
We didn't want to be in Oaks. We didn't want to um, follow our inner ways. We wanted to do, be more like them so that we could fit in when we, because we spent more time there than we spent at home. The hardest part I found about going out to Europe, which Coming back, coming back home. It's like I didn't even know my parents anymore. Like they didn't know my mother. That we were told to away from home too long. Couldn't even talk to each other like we used to. I was talking and laughing. She used to always tell me everything, tell us everything. We came back from the first year back from the hospital. She was like a stranger. She used to always talk to me and you know. Most times I had to back to her, but that first day back, I hardly understood what she said. The first year was a really bad year for me. It made me want to, made me want to go back to the third because I didn't know my parents. And, without communication with each other. I didn't like being there, but after a zero well, you go home in the summer, I, I kind of missed it and I wanted to go back because there was a lot going on. So, you know, we lived in isolation, I guess, two families, so, I don't know, it was strange. But I didn't miss living in the dorm, I was being with other people as well. Mm -hmm. You were trying to readjust back to, because uh, you're not used to being away from all the people. And if you were never taken out of your environment in the beginning, you would have never had to deal with all that, hey. Mm -hmm. You know? Yes, so, that's true. It changes. Yeah. And that says a lot because I think it really confuses an individual, especially a young person, because mm -hmm. then they really don't know where they fit. Mm -hmm you know, where they should have been. Lost connections anyway. Yeah. Really. And you never really thought about what you lost. Like you just accepted it. That's all I can compare to really to the relocation of Ypres. In 1959, in an era of government centralization, the Hebrani mute were not given a choice, but informed that they would be relocated to the more southern communities of Nain, Hopetail, Makovic, the Northwest River. They were taken from their home, forced to be relocated in communities that they were unaware of, they didn't know the hunting grounds, they didn't know the traditions and values of the communities that were already established. We were forced to go to, to residential schools and accept the behavior and the treatment that we had. And, just go on, we had to, we had to do it. You know, when you take a kid and put them in residential school, I mean, that's relocating that, mm -hmm. that person, yes. not just to, and it's not giving them the option to, I suppose it is, to live there all their lives. It's not about that, hey. Yeah. It's not about settling them. It's just relocating them, relocating them back, relocating them again relocating them back. It's just chaos, say. I left September. The first three or four months, all I wanted to do was come home. In November, that's the worst part again. We in school, about 10, 11 o'clock that morning. The principal called me down.
you know, a bad news for you. Have to go up. The father told me this morning. I was stood there looking at him, didn't know what to do. counselors, we had nobody to turn to really. We were up there on our own. We were just, there was nothing we could talk to host parents about personal things. They weren't our parents. If you went and said you were homesick or said there was something going on, they didn't believe you or show any compassion. I see someone who might help me. I walk up to his car and say, can you send me home please? I'm lonesome and it's making me sick. The person doesn't answer. He just looks at me and drives away, leaving me crying, standing in a cloud of dust. The next thing I know, I'm being told I'm a troublemaker. The principal of our school has been advised that I want to go home. I'm told that what I'm saying and feeling is upsetting others and causing problems for the people who run the place. And there's no way I can go home. All hope is lost. I just have to make it through this year. Or just your way of dealing with things and feel your feelings was to ignore it. There should have been guidance counselors here or, or counselors or something, somebody that we could have went to, that we could have turned to. Because I think it was there too that some of the feelings, when you were soft and little, made you resort to feelings of suicide. I don't know, there were several girls that tried. Uh, I was one of them. You tried to deal with your feelings by taking on an overdose. It only really made you sick. One of our friends tried to commit suicide. She took an overdose and we found her in the bathtub full of water. But the health parents never ever knew about it. We just stayed up with her all night. Of course, not to throw up. We thought she was going to die, but she, she didn't even know we were there. She didn't know where she was. It's so apparent now that our children age through a high rate within here and within our community. And all the communities actually on the coast. Now with my children, they ask mom, how come we don't, my daughters are all grown, they're past 20, how come we don't know how to make spread, how come we can't do the things you do, how come she didn't talk in a bit of to us. And I honestly know to this day that some of the reasons why I went wrong because I had behavior and the character and the attitudes were acceptable. It's how I had to function. And it's how I expected my children to function. I don't think any of us had any real opportunities to deal with all what we lost and all what made us shame to be books. <laughs> But um, things like this, I think, is even though we're this old now and we can't go back and teach our children, <laughs> it's too 
too late for our children to get back what we had when we were growing up. Now, when I look at my teenage daughter, I realize some of what I lost. How do I be a mother to her? I wasn't with my mother when I was her age. My heart breaks. And it, it was still happening. It, there's still residential schools. Now, there would be no way in hell that my children would go. It didn't matter to me if they didn't get their education, no way in hell would they go. Still have nightmares, I mean, I, I still have dreams of going back to that school, the dorm. And it's a very lonely and isolating feeling that I'd never want to experience again or any of my children. I think that's why a lot of us are, like I said on the video, going through addictions. No matter what kind of addictions, I think that's why a lot of us are in where we are today. A few years after I finished school, it was like I was just going on in circle. Never did anything, never worked. Depended on my parents, drank, got in trouble. It seemed like we were just took out of our home and got to uh, fend for yourself. But we came back home, we didn't know how to do it because we lost our culture, our language. We didn't know, we didn't know what to do. We lost faith in ourselves. Resilience and determination. We lost, seem like we lost hope. I was struck by the amount of loss. It was a lot of loss, and it was deep, deep inside our spirit. Because if you're put down for who you are, that has a major impact on your, on your life and your self-esteem. On June 11th, uh, the Prime Minister offered an apology to survivors of Indian residential schools, but we weren't included in the apology. Uh, actually, we were excluded. And he, he really used the words, with the exclusion of. And he said, Newfoundland, Langdor, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island. Mr. Speaker, I stand before you today to offer an apology to former students of Indian residential schools. The treatment of children in Indian residential schools is a sad chapter in our history. 132 federally supported schools were located in every province and territory except Newfoundland, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island. These were operated as joint ventures with Anglican, Catholic, Presbyterian, and United Churches. So we were excluded in the apology. Could I speak to that, you, sir? You can. And when the apology came on and he said, with the exclusion of Newfoundland, all the provinces of Canada have residential schools, with the exclusion of Newfoundland Labor, PEI, and New Brunswick, it was just like someone stabbed a, you know, stabbed you with a, a knife or something and ripped it out. I was glad that other people got an apology. <coughs> Where was ours? Was what I felt. I felt the same way about where's our apology. I thought that whether or not we were run by the missions or the federal government, the churches, whoever, whoever, whoever did ran, it makes no difference. Those schools, who met, no matter who ran them, the survivors are here today, and the apology was today. And we are Canadian citizens, but along with the rest of Canada. That's how I felt. That at least we could be acknowledged. Yes. At least we could be acknowledged. The government of Canada built an educational system in which very young children were often forcibly removed from their homes, often taken far from their communities. Many were inadequately fed, clothed, and housed. All were deprived 
of the care and nurturing of their parents, grandparents, and communities. First Nations, Inuit, and Métis languages and cultural practices were prohibited in these schools. Therefore, on behalf of the Government of Canada and all Canadians, I stand before you in this chamber so vital, so central to our existence as a country to apologize to Aboriginal peoples for the role the Government of Canada played in, Indian, in the Indian residential schools system. To the approximately 80,000 living former students and all family members and communities, the Government of Canada now recognizes that it was wrong to forcibly remove children from their homes, and we apologize for having done this. We now recognize that it was wrong to separate children from rich and vibrant cultures and traditions, that it created a void in many lives and communities, and we apologize for having done this. We now recognize that in separating children from their families, we undermine the ability of many to adequately parent their own children and sowed the seeds for generations to follow. And we apologize for having done this. We now recognize that far too often these institutions gave rise to abuse or neglect and were inadequately controlled. And we apologize for failing to protect you. Not only did you suffer these abuses as children, but as you became par parents, you were powerless to protect your own children from suffering the same experience. And for this, we are sorry. The burden of this experience has been on your shoulders for far too long. The burden of this experience is properly ours as a government and as a country. There is no place in Canada for the attitudes that inspired the Indian residential school system to ever prevail again. You have been working on recovering from this experience for a long time. And in a very real sense, we are now joining you on this journey. The Government of Canada sincerely apologizes and asks the forgiveness of the Aboriginal peoples of this country for failing them so profoundly. should apologize to the kids on coast and through all that, all that, all those bad experiences. I don't know who should apologize, but someone shouldn't. We'll probably feel it better here in the home. I don't know who. There should be an apology for what they put us through all those years. I wish. Um the older ones, like our parents and grandparents, because they have stories too, and it's intergenerational, and uh, we were affected, and our kids are affected too. The first systematic schooling of Inuit children in Labrador began in Nain and Okak in the 1780s. This was organized by the Moravian missionaries from Europe. By the early 19th century, the Moravian Mission ran boarding schools in Mikovic and Nain. Inuit children were taught in Inuktitut. Children of mixed European and Inuit ancestry were taught in English. Let's see, so my mum went to boarding school in Nain. She starts out as a really good place. She said they used to sew, mending socks, and knitting socks, and I believe helping with lunches. Um, fetching water and clean, wash, scrub the floors and wash clothes. And then through the conversation, like she tells us, you know, they used to uh, get punished. Uh, I know some people have resented that these kids are made to work, but I can only say the results of it are remarkable because those kids, as they became mothers and uh, taken care of a home, can show the difference mm -hmm. uh, as compared to ones that did not go through that uh, mm -hmm. training. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's nothing to be uh, remarked about or oh, what a shame that they have to labor so hard. Mm -hmm. It does a person good when they're young to labor and learn, you know.
But I think they all loved their school. I don't think there's one that has resented it. Mm -hmm. And there was one time my grandmother, Bella Lee, all she was working at the um, a boarding school too, and, and she was the, the house parent. Her parents were in Hamashuk, and uh, they tried to come and visit her because my great grandparents came to get some food to bring back to our fishing place, Hamashuk. Katie Hedish was already gone home when she used to go home, and they were locked in, in the dorm. Or the door was locked from the outside, so they couldn't uh, visit, they just spoke uh, by the window because they were, they were locked in. So it's um, about time that we told our stories and uh, everybody know that we went through this similar things that the First Nations people went through when the other knew it too. I can only Imagine what it must have felt like for Anne Fulda and everybody else that went to residential schools. How it felt and how much they missed their families and their home and their culture. Um, I am so proud that they're all here today and they have the courage, they have the courage to speak and to tell their stories. And I know how hard it is to get all those scared, ugly feelings out inside. And but it's very good to do it. I, 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 I did it. And it feels a lot better after you get all that stuff that's so deep down inside that you're ashamed of or that hurt you so bad. I thought it was a positive experience. And so those feelings that we had start resurfacing, started coming back. It, and it's very hurtful. But still, we have to try to be strong and deal with it and, and move on and learn from it and let it go. Because if we hang on to it, it'll only hurt us longer. And the quicker we deal with it, it'll help us be a stronger person. And there are times sometimes where I think I wish I could go back so I could start all over with my parents again. And maybe if I stayed home, I would have. Maybe I would have been able to save my father, or maybe he still would have been doing I think about things like that. After thinking about that, I get memories. And some, some were good, a lot, a lot of years were good, and now I'm married. I had three kids. It took me about Nearly 30, 30 years to finally get my, to finally graduate get my university degree and get to where I am now. No, I wouldn't trade it, no, for anything, all this. Higher level of education, good problem solving skills, develop more friendships, like lifetime. We were able to learn to be away from our community and therefore we were more able to succeed in things. And if you look back at it now in the community, um, we're the ones that are working and have the good paying jobs. Because, but it was all because we had to sacrifice who we were, our culture and our family for it. The boarding school system eventually ended in the early 1980s. The dorms of Northwest River closed as higher grade levels were offered in the coastal communities. I was born in 1979, at the tail end of the residential school era. My father went to the residential schools in the mid-60s, and in talking with my dad about his experiences there, I came to understand a little bit more about just what it is that shaped him and in turn shaped me as well. And when I understand a little bit more about the strength 
that he had to get through what it was that he had to go through at the residential school it certainly deepens my respect for my father and for my aunts and uncles who also went to that school. I get a lot of strength from some of my beliefs. And just as I believe that there's an inner child who was hurt in me, I also believe that there's an inner elder. And that's where I turn when I need to be guided to my inner elder. And uh, I've often heard us say that elders are dying. But elders are not dying. Elders are still coming. So I believe in the strength of elders. Being able to speak out like I never used to before, like I was too shy to speak out, now I can. To be with the children more and show the youth that they have the courage to do things too in the community. I think one of my strengths is uh, that I have um, a lot of patience. I think that's from having to bring up my family on my own. And I, I got some strength today from going through this and uh, being a survivor of the residential school. I received my strength from my uh, family and from my mother and father. Once in a past, when times are rough and it's hard, even though they're not here, I always call upon them. In my reaction, or whether it's through a form of dream, I'll get my direction and strength from them. When, when I was in the dorm, I uh, <clears throat> learned to fight, and I thought that was a strength, and I carried that through. Uh, most of my life, yeah. but uh, I've changed, and now I think my strength is helping people, and uh, it, that takes a lot sometimes. It's hard, so I regather my strength by going out on the land and being where my ancestors were. My forefathers, where my grandfather did. Strengths I like to pass on to you guys is if I can help in any way. I find my strength from the um, the land, the water, the sky and the sea, Mother Nature. I think my biggest strength is um, my pride in who I am and I just try to prove it to my children by doing those small things like drying my meat, collecting my fish, berries, mostly traditional clothes and um, language. So I hope to pass on the same pride I feel in who I am to everybody else. I think what my strength is, what I am, I'm a Inuk and no one can take that away from me and I just want to give you the extra strength of your identity, I guess. My strength, being on the land, knowing who I am, and being able to pass on the knowledge that I collected through the years. I pass it on to my children, my family, friends. <laughs> Just helping people out. Knowing that, knowing that I did something and they take that with them and teach, teach their children or anybody else.
I think it's it's good that some of us are getting to that point and realizing that and recognize that this happened and what can we do to make to help us move on or make ourselves better for our children for the future generations and I think this is a, a good start here you know today <laughs> <laughs>